Okay, still some people coming in. Quick show of hands. Who of you has never heard of Kafka? Okay. Who of you has used Kafka? Okay, good, excellent. Then your talk is just right. Introduction to what Kafka is, and introduction for those of you who have some idea but want to know, know, more, want to know more about it. All right, so very brief word about me. My name is Sven-Erik Knob, or Sven will do the job just nicely. Uh, I am not Swedish, I'm German, but I live in England. Um, I've been with Confluent now for a bit, mo bit more than a year, and you find me under that Twitter address. Right, Confluent. Who of you has heard of Confluent? One person, good Lord. Okay, right, who is Confluent? Confluent was founded in 2014 um, by the original creators of Kafka. So what is Kafka? Kafka was created at LinkedIn in 2010 by uh, Jay Krebs, Nehan Ekade, and uh, Jun Rao. Um, they gave the Kafka itself to the Apache Software Foundation, uh, Open Software, in um, 2011, um, and then decided that they want to add more to Kafka itself, um, services, so, um, uh, support, and enterprise features. So they um, founded their company, own company, in 2014, which is uh, still headquartered in Palo Alto. Uh, with a mission to propose Kafka and then use it as a streaming platform. And yes, obviously, I have to do this. Um, we are hiring. Um, very fast growing startup, now about 650 people. Um, when I joined last year, we were 250. So you have an idea of how fast we are growing. Right. Why use Kafka? Is anyone familiar with a picture like this? Does this describe, in, in any shape or form, your application world? Lots of different services. Now, we don't live in a world anymore where you have one single application server talking to one single database. Or if you do, you probably experience all kinds of pain, like you'll be able to one, upgrade once a year, maybe twice if you're really lucky. Um, and when if something goes down, the whole system goes down. We don't live in that world anymore. We live in a world of microservices. Lots of different services talking to each other. They all should have their own database, because if you build lots of microservices around the same database, you will very quickly realize that you've just linked the whole thing together again into a what is effectively still a big monolithic application. All these servers need to talk to each other, and they do that in all kinds of protocols. REST API, RMI, um, you name it, some kind of queuing system in there as well. They produce log files, they produce debug outputs and other bits and pieces, and they have to go somewhere. And typically, when you start building this up, you wind up with a system that um, is stitched together and no one can actually look anymore and find out what's going on in the system. Right. So the vision of Jay Krebs and his team at LinkedIn, who were exactly in this position, was to create something like this, have a common platform in between that links all the bits and pieces together, puts all the data in that, everything talks to the string platform in the middle, all the events going in, and then everyone else just can pick up this information again. So the question now is, what is Apache Kafka? Any ideas? No one. Uh, who thinks it's a public subscribe queue? A few people. Hey, good. Who believes our marketing department and says it's an event streaming platform? A few more people. Good, you're gullible. Um, I have a job for you. Um, a database? Not really a traditional database, but if you look at some of the talks around Kafka, you will find that people talking about an inside-out database story. All of this is not what Kafka is. It's what Kafka does. What Kafka is, is an immutable log. An immutable log. What does that mean? Well, you know what the log is you write something to the end of a file. Immutable, you don't change the content beforehand afterwards. You only change things by adding, appending things to the end. That looks a bit like this. So if you produce, if you write something to Kafka, you append an event, something, to the end of the queue. Appending to the end of the file is the fastest possible operation you can make when updating a file, because you don't have to go and seek 
position, you don't have to overwrite anything, all you have to do is just add something to the end. These events are ordered in time. Now, when we talk about Kafka, we'll find out that there are lots of different topics, things you can write to, so you don't have to all write to one single place. There are lots of different topics you can, queues you can write into. This is one particular queue in here. When I first learned about Kafka a year ago, yes, I should have learned much earlier, but I was just go my head down and said, hey, work for us, um, is they explained to me that Kafka is a bit like a, a tape drive. But it didn't seem very logical to me, because a tape drive is something like a cassette tape, if you ever remember these kind of things, um, that you can go back, seek back, and write over. To me, Kafka always seemed to be more like this. Anyone recognize what that is? No one? Oh, come on. It's only 100 years ago we had these things. <laughs> it's a stock ticker. Some a device you connect to telegraph, well, it sends information out from a stock exchange, for example, and writes to a, a tape, a paper tape, and a tape. And that's the kind of thing that I think, of when I think of Kafka, that's what Kafka looks like. Right, writing is one thing. Reading from it, interesting part. We're going to consume from Kafka. So we have different consumers, and all they need to know is where they are in that queue. All they need is the offset. Now, they can keep that in memory and just remember it. They can write it out to an external database, or most likely, they write that offset, information offset, I have read this polling event at this particular position. I need to uh, remember that fact and then uh, continue. Back to Kafka itself, there's a special topic for that called the offsets topic. So we write at the end, and the consumers pick up. They will never catch up, because we keep writing new events, but they will be, get very close. Different consumers work at different speeds. Some consumers might start at the beginning. They just want to get an overview. What happened in that time? Some consumers are trying to be as close as possible to that time. In that. Now, I have a picture for you of what the consumer looks like in reality as well. There you are. Um, so these lovely ladies over here, they read from a topic, a piece of paper. They have an offset, the position they currently read on. Uh, there are two of them independently working on it. And we even can talk about retention. Because at one stage, we have to throw stuff away. We can't write forever to a topic. Why? Because um, there is no such thing as infinite disk space. And if you still believe that kind of thing, I have a, a bridge to sell to you. So um, at one stage, we have to throw them away. And there's the bin that goes away, retention. After a while, the message disappears. How long is something you set up? By default, Kafka keeps events around for seven days. You can set it up to do six hours. You can set it up to um, keep the data for a year if you want to. So that's publish and subscribe, or in our case, produce and consume. Read data off the system, um, uh, write the test the system. If the consumer, as with the consumer at the end there, cannot catch up, we have a problem. If the consumer is faster than the producer, it's easy. Yeah, well, producer, they just consumer sits around idle, waits for the next message to come in. If a producer is faster than the consumer, we have an issue, because suddenly um, our disk space is filling up, and retention will kick in, before the consumer can catch up, so we're going to lose messages. That might be an issue, it might not be an issue. If it's your credit card statement, or if it's your, um, your last bank, bank changement, or order you just made, and the consumer can't catch up, you won't be very happy about that. How do we solve this problem? Well, if they want multiple consumers together, but they can't share the same offset. Sharing the same offset is just as insecure if one of them crashes, the other one can't pick up from that. So the typical way of solving this problem is to parallelize things, shard them, or in our case, partition them. You can split a topic into multiple partitions. And then a producer can write to them. Now, by default, there just goes one robin and writes one to the other. And that's fine, it's just very paralyzing it. But of course, this has one issue. 
which is the order is gone. Yeah. The order that first we preserved, sorry, should I move that away? There's a swaggy afterwards, pick it up. Um, so the, for a topic with a single partition, the order in time is guaranteed. If you spread it over multiple partitions, the order is not guaranteed anymore. Think of the consumers. The consumers tend to read things in batches, because it's much faster this way of reading, I don't know, 50 or 100 events than just read a single event off. So um, they would read from the partitions in a different order. You can easily test that by writing 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and so on into a into topic. And if you then go and um, run a consumer reading off that, you will see data coming in batches um, with the number of offset, the number of partitions they have in there. How do you solve this problem? Well, use a key. Now, a message going in, a, a record, a um, event, is actually made of several parts. One of them is a meta information, offset, timestamp, and so on. Then there is an optional key. Don't have to provide one. And then there's the message itself, the value, the, the, the uh, payload of that. If you provide a key, then by default, we will take the key. We calculate the hash from that, uh, modulo the number of partitions we have, and that gives us a number. Which means if your key, for example, is your, your customer ID or your bank account ID or a stock ticket uh, symbol or the particular sensor that you read data from, then the order for that key is guaranteed to be preserved. But it is not true for all keys. But it doesn't really matter whether you make a payment to your account and I make a payment to the account or things are ordered in time. Most of the time, that's not the case. So this is the way you split things up. You take a topic, you create partitions for it, with a, you define a key, uh, a sensible key. Timestamp is not a sensible key, um, because the hash of that is just an arbitrary number. Um, and then you have a topic you can read from. Right. Now, how do we actually work with these multiple partitions? Well, we group consumers together. Multiple consumers working together in consort, reading from one topic. Each of these consumers is in a consumer group. And that consumer group itself will read all the information of, of a topic, all the different partitions. A partition is assigned to a particular consumer within that um, consumer group. And they're all held together by a group ID. It's just the name that defines in that. Now, this is dynamic. Which means if I lose one of them, let's have here one, two, three, uh, zero, one, two. Of course, with your computer experts, we start with zero. Um, so, and, and we have three different partitions here. If I lose this partition, at least consumer reading from a partition, then I'll simply assign this partition to another consumer, and it keeps on reading. And that works in console as well. So, let's say you have uh, 20 partitions and you have two or three consumers, and then you find that it doesn't scale anymore, it doesn't catch up anymore. You simply add dynamically another consumer with the right group ID to it, and we'll run a um, repartitioning event and assign the partitions to different consumers now, and then they continue to work, which means we're guaranteed that we can catch up, and if we have too many consumers around, for example, more consumers than there are partitions available, then you sit around idle, and I can switch them off. And now I'm expanding that, reducing that. It's a very important feature of something when you build a distributed application, because it means you can scale uh, during the runtime. You don't have to bring the system down. Now, scalability this way is one way. How do we actually guarantee the data is there where it's supposed to be? If I write information to disk, who of you uses a database? Aha, more people, good stuff. Now, if you run a commit on your database, you know that data is supposed to be safe for the ACID properties, atomic, consistent, isolated, durable. You write on a disk, you typically run an F-sync. You actually force the data onto disk. And that takes some time, which is why you're trying to optimize this in some way, shape, or form. Kafka doesn't do this by default. It doesn't push data on disk. We sometimes need to deal with hundreds of thousands of messages a second. And if you push them down every single one on an F-Sync, it would not be able to do that, write down the physical disk. 
Also, if you actually look at the layers inside the kernel and when it actually physically hits the, the disk, there are quite a few layers in between. You're never exactly 100% sure whether this works properly or not. A better way of solving this issue, of guaranteeing the data is there and speeding up the process, is to, again, parallelize it. In our case, through replication. And you see, that this is supposed to be the replication factor equals three at the bottom. I didn't quite think it would cut off at the end. So here we have four different brokers. Kafka is made up of brokers. Brokers is the bit of program you run um, that your consumers, your and your producers, uh, um, communicate with, um, write to read from. So we have four different brokers here. We have a topic, topic one, and we have um, four different partitions. And with a replication factor of three, let's see if this magic works. By pressing this button and then going there. Ah, fantastic. So um, we have a leader, writing to the reader, and then we have two followers who also get the information. And that's true for all the topics, uh, for all the topics, or two for all the partitions as well. Now note how they are uh, uh, um, distributed. When you create a topic and you define the number of partitions, then you um, have uh, a, a round robin fashion where the leaders and where the replicas are, so to spread the information out as evenly as possible across all the brokers. That can be, in principle, dynamically um, modified, but if there are terabytes there, then it, it might take some time. You set it up beforehand in, in a reasonable fashion. And the broker will this automatically do, do for you. So, each data information is, if you have a replication factor set up higher than one, one just means that only the leader has the information, um, spread over multiple brokers. So now I don't have to run an F-Sync. Because I know, even if I lose a broker, someone else has the data and it can continue. I will even dynamically reassign the role of the leader to another, um, uh, another broker, in this case, that one here. And um, work can continue. Now, there is a catch in this picture. I'm not sure if you saw that. I have a replication factor of three, and yet this particular partition, actually the last two partitions, the last three partitions, if I remember correctly, um, don't have a replication factor of three anymore. They lost their, their broker. It actually does the work. How is that going to work? The first question that I ask is, what is the thing about producers and consumers talking to the leader? And what are the guarantees you make to the producer? The thing about the leader is, the, your application only talks to the leader of a partition. It doesn't talk to the followers. It's the job of the followers to pick up information from the particular leader. And that's how these things uh, hang together. Which means, effectively, the error is on the wrong way, but it doesn't matter. So producers write to the leader, the partitions pick up. The producer itself, in its configuration, defines the required guarantees about the data. So there could be, um, this is the ax value down there, acknowledgement value. You can set it to ax equals zero. Fire and forget. I don't care about the data, I just want to write it somewhere. I'm not sure how useful it is, but sometimes it's just log information. If it's there, it's good. If it doesn't, it goes away, who cares? Default is one. The leader responds back and says, ha-ha, I have the data. Producer, you can continue to write. Or you can set it to all, minus one, same thing, which means every single replica has to go back and says, I have the data correctly. And only then will the producer continue to write to the leader. If I have three brokers, a replication factor of three, I set my producer to, equal, to uh, x equals all, and then I lose one of the brokers. What happens? I can't write anymore because I never get the acknowledgement back. So we need to find a compromise between these two sets. And that is, wait, back. The 
in sync replicas, ISR. So an ISR, in sync replica, is a replica that's defined that has the latest amount of data. It's in sync with the leader. And we can define for each topic how many of these replicas we need to be in sync before we go back to the producer and say, I have the data correctly. But typically, you're trying to balance out correctness of data, whether it's continue to be able to work. Can't always do that perfectly. Um, the famous, uh, I've got a, the theorem, I forgot the now, but we'll come back in a second. Um, behind that, we'll, we'll stop from doing that. But in this case, I can do something about it. I can say, if at least two of them go back and say, yes, I have the data, then this is deemed to be acceptable. So I can lose one broker and still continue to work. Now, this is important because these kind of applications running, uh, that run Kafka, tend to be running 24-7, 365 days a year. And um, 52 months, 52 weeks a year. And um, the, so you want to upgrade this. Kafka is a fast evolving soft piece of software. It's now at version 2.2. Version 2.3 is uh, not very far away. So you want to be able to do an upgrade. But running an upgrade means you have to bring it down. If you have to shut the whole cluster down, you have an outage. But having the ability to bring in one broker down upgrading it and bringing it back up again, I can do a rolling upgrade without having to shut the whole system down. It continues to work. And the producers and consumers are none the wiser of that fact. So I have to have the ability. It's not just about crashing the software, but also the ability to do maintenance on that. The ISR list is interesting for something else. Someone has to choose um, which of these brokers will take over the role of the leader. Now, ideally, this is a, a broker that is in the ISR list, guaranteed to have the latest amount of data, which means a consumer reading from it can get now the correct amount of data back. And if I don't have that, um, then I lost data. I can configure Kafka to say, allow um, unclean UD election, but I normally don't want to do that because data tends to be very important for me. So uh, we want to have a sufficient number of brokers in the ISR list tools just to check that, whether that's the case, and if they fall out, you typically want to investigate why that's going on. Begs the question, who is choosing the leader? Who is actually in charge? Well, one of these brokers is special. It is the controller. Who is the controller? Whoever came first and shouted the loudest and said, I want to be the controller. I want to be Spartacus. So, um, how does that work? Well, that's the magic of Zookeeper. Who of you knows about Zookeeper? Not as many as I hoped. OK, let me explain what Zookeeper is. Zookeeper is a piece of technology, if I'm not mistaken, uh, originally developed by Hortonworks, certainly for Hadoop, um, that allows you to, to um, work um, information like this, like who is the leader at the moment in a distributed system, is based on a quorum. A quorum-based system means that a majority, at least ha more, more than half of the members, have to agree on a state of the world. In case of three nodes in here, Zookeeper, you can configure the higher nodes if you like, um, that means two of them have to be alive, one of them can go away, and you still have a quorum. You might know some politics. So they talk to each other, and they make sure that they're all alive. Zookeeper is a key value store, effectively, where the keys are sorted in a, in a tree, like a file system. It starts a slash, then there's a slash controller, there's a slash broker, there's a slash zookeeper, and so on, and there might be subdirectories in that as well. These nodes you put in there can be of two types, Z nodes. They are either persistent nodes, Lookup table. Kafka uses this to write information about the topics, uh, about access control lists, about users, uh, about quotas, and stuff like that in there. This is persistent data that we need in case we bring the broker down and bring it back up again. We need the persistent data. Kafka doesn't store that kind of information in its own um, storage systems. 
And we have, I love that word, ephemeral nodes, nodes that go away. This is a node that are linked to an ex external process, in my case, a broker, with a heartbeat that goes on and has to go back from time to time and say, I'm still alive. And if the heartbeat goes away, by default that's six seconds, then we declare that predictor broker dead. If that broker dead is the controller, well, then we have to elect a new controller. And then we next in line of that, it's another control, a broker will take over the role of the controller. That's how things work together. So if you are, after this talk, interested in Kafka, I want to try it out. Um, can download Kafka either from the Apache website or from the Confluent website. And um, you will always have to install a zookeeper and a broker. The default setup, um, Confluent dev environment, just has one zookeeper, one crawler. You have to have the zookeeper in place because we store our persistent data in that. So information like topics, which you need, otherwise you can't write to anything. Um, but in the production environment, you will find three or often five brokers, uh, five zookeepers. And any number of brokers, 30, 50, 100, or something like that, looking after your data. The default setup for a production environment is three zookeepers and three brokers, which can give you good guarantees and still make it possible for you to run the system and be able to upgrade it, uh, the running upgrade, without losing any connectivity. Very good. So that's all I have to tell you about how Kafka internally works. I could go on for another day or two. Um, there's a training course that tells you just about the operation part that takes three days, um, because there are lots of details behind it. But as a quick overview, for the technical part, that's sufficient. Now the question is, why do you heck do you want to use this? What's Kafka as a use case for? The symbol for Kafka, like a K, uh, with the different nodes. These almost standard way, the, the gateway drug, so if you speak, um, for Kafka is um, extracting data from a database. Uh, are you familiar with the term ETL? Some nodding. Extract, transform, load. Take data out of one system, do something useful with it, hopefully, dump it into another system. Why do you want to do that? Well, typically, because complicated analysis on the relation database is very expensive. Um, if you want to do data mining, if you want to do um, kind of caching information, um, if you want to have long step st storage in place or something like that, um, that uh, using your relation database for that is very expensive. Uh, these things are um, hard to maintain. Um, they need a lot of resources and so on. So the idea of extracting data from a relation database or any other database and then dumping it in some kind of data sync is a very common one. Data sync could be a cache, a memory cache. It could be whatever, uh, HDFS, it could be S3, or whatever you come up with, Elasticsearch, and so on. So that's kind of a standard place where when I, I'm, I'm a solutions architect for a Confluent, uh, when I get called in and, and uh, to try to draw up a, an architectural review of what you're going to do, that's how they start out. Get data out of here, dump data over there. What are we doing with the data over there? Well, we run batch processes. We do the calculations on that. We do end of day uh, runtime to figure out whether you have enough money in the bank or something like this. But that's not the only use case. A very common one is IoT. Are you familiar with IoT? Internet of Things. Um, if you're not familiar with that, walk outside and just have a look around. All the cameras looking at you, all the sensors are everywhere. Uh, the gadgets you wear, like Apple Watches and that's all IoT. Little devices that keep track of things, a few mostly. And they produce an awful lot of data. Whether it's weather station, whether it's our watches, whether it's a car. You wouldn't believe how much data a car produces these days and where it divides it to. Not just the state of the car itself, but also about its surroundings. We're approaching an age where the cars drive themselves. They need to, for that, produce an awful lot of, mention of, of um, amount of data, and they have to put it somewhere. And more likely than not, they're going to write it to Kafka. All the major car companies in the world use Kafka to store their data. 
but sometimes you don't need even IoT devices anymore. Every time you click on something in the website, um, the position of your mouse hovering over a picture or something like that, as well as the data you put in, I'm ordering something, uh, most likely not tracked and often written into something like Kafka. Some of this data you need to have available in real time. You can't just dump it into the data sink and then wait for the end of day calculation. You want to calculate it right away. Now here's the good news. Because of the design of Kafka, consumers don't have to sit there and when they, agree, they grab the information, it's gone. It's there persistently for, in computer terms, a long time. So I can go and I can run my calculations. Uh, I can bring up other applications that read the data off and do something useful with it. One of them is a streaming application. Who has dealt with streaming applications before? Not as many as I thought. Okay. You might have heard the term Spark or Flink or some other tools like that. These are streaming applications within clusters. They do all kinds of calculations with data coming past in streams. And most likely not, they have a pipeline packed in, and that pipeline is most likely going to be Kafka. You don't need those kind of tools if you're dealing with Kafka, because Kafka has its own streaming library. And with its own streaming library, you can extract data from those topics. You can do calculations in them filter them, uh, exchange, enrich the data, for example, or X out your credit card number, or, um, uh, or uh, filter down to the, the amount of information you need, anonymize the data, for example, it's a quite typical uh, question you have, or group them together, maximum with them, a time window of five minutes or something like this. Um, these are kind of streaming locations, and they write their results back to another topic, which you can then use and write into a data sync, for example, or put it on a screen somewhere. The streaming API provided in Kafka is based on the producer and consumer API. At the bottom, everything is based on the producer and consumer API. By the way, Kafka is written in, what do you think? Scala. Scala, very good, excellent. That's true-ish, as in it started out in Scala, but nowadays it's written in, in Java, uh, Java 8. Um, and we're just pushing it to Java 11. So um, the core is written in Scala, but all the additional bits and pieces of that are written in Java. So it's the truth of the producers and consumers. They can be written in Java or Scala. Actually, there's a C++ API that stops there. It doesn't have a streaming API, but you can write the things in, in Python or in Go or in, 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 in uh, Node.js or something else as well. So the streaming API is built on top of the producers and consumers. If you program in Java or, uh, or in um, Scala, um, it uses a DSL, a domain-specific language, to define the different nodes, the kind, of, the kind of process you want to do, to build a so-called topology. And then you start it off, and it just runs, tracks data from one or several topics, and dumps it into typically one or several topics as well. It uses a state store for that. In our case, as RocksDB, you can configure it to be something else, but RocksDB is quite useful for that kind of purpose, to keep track of things. On top of the streaming API, we have actually built a uh, a non-language specific thing I call KSQL, Kafka SQL. That's not SQL as you know it from the Legion database. It will always use a similar kind of syntax, select from and so on. It is a streaming process. The query they run there will never finish. They are effectively just representations of the streaming API, which is still a reasonably complex piece of code, but here you can just write on a single statement. And you run this in KSQL. KSQL has a KSQL server running with that that just connects to this and does all the hard work of building a scripting application for you. So you can build a whole application in Kafka, extracting data from a database using, there's a connector API that allows you to um, uh, read data off syncs without any programming, it's just a configuration file. Dump data into a sync like Elasticsearch or Hadoop or something like that. Again, a configuration file specified, started up in it for that. And in the middle you can transform the data using KSQL and you have written the whole thing, a whole application, without writing a single line of code, just configuration files. Right. That's all I have time for. Just a few bits and pieces. If you are interested in Kafka, obviously go to our website or go to Apache Kafka website. Our website has more information on it. It's in enterprise and professional services um, set up. There are a bunch of books that are available from our website. You can download as PDFs for free including um, Apache Kafka, the definitive guide, which is the very first thing I wrote when I, read when I um, started out, which is actually written by Neha, uh, 
Gwen Shapira, who is a um, uh, force of nature, and uh, Todd, who I believe is here somewhere to give a talk as well. Um, another very good book I can recommend if you're interested in event the driven design, what you can do with Kafka beyond the simple putting data out and writing data somewhere, is the book by Step Penn Stepford, a good friend of mine who is uh, based in the UK office. Um, it's a short book, but very intense book. There are also Kafka summits. One of them is in London next week. I believe there are a few spaces left over, so if you have a budget left and uh, some time left, um, it might be a short term. Um, but definitely, if you're interested in that kind of thing, in San Francisco is a big summit. We actually have three summits per year. Um, the New York one was the beginning of the year, uh, London and then San Francisco in September. I hope to. I have a couple of talks running in there. I hope I can make it there as well. I go to kafka summitorg It is organized by Confluent, but it is open source. Lots and lots of people talk about their experience with Kafka, what they've done with it. From an open source point of view, they're not necessarily Confluent customers. Right. Uh, I have to put the we are hiring on it because we are hiring. If you understand that kind of thing, technology, you find that exciting. You want to work in a um, uh, fast growing, high performance uh, kind of um, startup, then uh, have, have a chat. Let's look at our careers website. Um, otherwise, we have, I think, two minutes left for questions. And if you have any questions, grab me outside or use my Twitter feed um, to. Uh,